Good afternoon and welcome to Speak Your Mind. I am uh, fortunate enough and honored to have in with me in studio the ambassador for the French Embassy and recipient of the National Order of Merit of Chevalier, Mr. F Francois Xavier Leger. Thank you for coming on the show and uh, thank afternoon. you for your invitation. Thank you so much. Obviously, um, a lot is going on around the world, and you know France is also there in terms of assistance. I'm talking about the um, Ukraine, or rather the Putin war. Now, as we know, Ukraine yields some of the world's largest grain. With the Putin war removing that grain, or quite being quite difficult to remove the grain from uh, Ukraine, what are some of the measures currently undertaken by France in order to help assist this? <laughs> First of all, I would like just to remind to the listeners uh, what are the uh, what is the origin of this war. Yeah. Uh, this war is due to the uh, invasion of Ukraine by Russia, and uh, all the international community they condemned, in fact, this invasion, which is totally illegal, and we can witness now a lot of crimes, and uh, the population of Ukraine is facing a lot of danger and a lot of destruction. One of the effects, obviously, of this war in Ukraine is uh, the uh, food security uh, problem. And especially, as you mentioned, in fact, we have now uh, at least 20 million of tons of, green, of grains being uh, stored in Ukraine yeah. and which cannot be uh, brought outside uh, to reach the beneficiaries and the customers and the world market, and including Fiji. And uh, so what are we doing? Uh, because the situation now is worsening. We consider that after the crop season, after the summer in Ukraine, it won't be only 20 million tons, but 80 million tons, which will uh, be uh, stuck there. So what is doing the international community, and France is a part of it, is first to try to bring this grain out, so try to discuss uh, with all stakeholders to secure the way to bring this uh, grain out, this production out from Ukraine, either uh, from sea, by sea, by the Black Sea port, or either by road from uh, Romania, for example. And the other point is to try to bring some assistance to the farmers in Ukraine, uh, to help them to protect, to preserve their production, because obviously the war is occurring now in Ukraine. So a part of the production is destroyed or cannot be, uh, cannot be sustained, for example. And so it will affect, obviously, the, uh, the, the, the crops in the future, the production in the future. And another point is to bring some assistance to the countries which are the most in need. Uh, and for this EU, and France is a member state of EU, so we are implementing a special program mm -hmm. with the help of the World Food Program, for example, to bring some assistance to the countries which are directly affected by the lack of, uh, of uh, cereals and also the rise of the price of uh, wheat flour, for example. Mm. And uh, the idea is to try to compensate it and try to, diverse, to, div to, to, to divert some production uh, to these countries, especially those who are the most, the most in need. And how long can they keep the grain there before, uh, let's say, it goes bad? You know, the grain, it can be stored, if it's being stored in proper condition, it can be stored for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. The only point is uh, now we know that the Russian army, they destroyed already some uh, facilities which are being used uh, to store the grain. So some, uh, some part of that production had been already destroyed, you know. So that's the important point. So it can be, if it's stored in a proper way, it can stay like this for a long time. But meanwhile, what is happening? Obviously, the world market prices are increasing, and the population with especially low income, and we, we rely the more, let's say, on imports from yeah. the world, world market, they are very much affected. And, you know, with, with that being said, it's just, it's just hard to believe that it, it takes time to get this out, and with everything that's going on, I can understand the measures that you've spoken about, through road, by sea, and even uh, by railway. Um, are you looking at other alternatives of securing that grain? Is there anything that you know probably you haven't highlighted? What we have to bear in mind is, in fact, uh, the Russian government is always mentioning the sanction against Russia about this uh, food uh, um, lack of grain on the world market. 
But in fact, the sanctions, they don't affect uh, food, food production, in fact. So this is not true. It's only the impact of the war itself and the fact that, the, obviously, the Russian army is preventing these uh, special ships who can bring the grain outside from Ukraine. They prevent this ship from leaving uh, the port in Ukraine. This is why we have now uh, this problem, this lack of uh, cereals on the world market. Mm. So that's what we, are, we have to work on, uh, to discuss with all parties, to try to secure the way to export this grain, uh, even though, unfortunately, the war is continuing. Now, I understand that uh, France has continued to maintain or try to maintain dialogue with the uh, Kremlin leader. Now, what are some of the positive things or things that might have helped through the discussions? You know, uh, France, we have a very consistent position, which is to condemn, obviously, the Russian aggression on Ukraine. We consider nobody can justify it, nobody can explain it, there's no reason behind it, it's totally illegal, and Russia should withdraw from Ukraine. So the, our, our position is very consistent. Having said that, we know also that that war will come to an end. At one moment it will end, and uh, all the participants will have to go around the table, and they will have to talk and to define a framework for the future relation, and also to ensure also security and uh, the status of Ukraine, uh, and to ensure to Ukraine uh, security for its border and, and f also for its population. So we have to talk with the president of Russia, and this is a part of diplomacy, and it doesn't mean that we, we want to compromise on the legal aspect or the political aspect of this war. Now, um, I'm glad you said that because mass, and I mean mass atrocities were discovered, especially in the areas that were previously occupied by Russia, especially with uh, Abuka in particular. How is France working towards helping the area of Abuka? So, in fact, um, I guess that uh, the listener might n not know it, but we uh, dispatch some uh, experts from the French police, uh, scientists from the French police, to try to, uh, to find all the, the pieces of evidence of these uh, mass massacres and crime scene uh, in Ukraine. And it's very important to do it now, to document the files, which could be used later on uh, in front of uh, international justice, for example, the International Court of Justice, for example, when th that court will have to, uh, to document and to study and to judge about these crimes. Uh, so that's what we are doing now. Well, I mean, that's, that's really good in, in terms of being on the ground, trying to be, get there firsthand. But I'd like to talk more on this. We'll just take a quick break and we'll return here on Speak Your Mind. Welcome back to Speak Your Mind, and with me I have the uh, ambassador for the French Embassy, Mr. Francois Xavier Leger. Now, you spoke about some of the things that the uh, France, the that, that France is currently doing in Bukha. What I'm interested in is the other measures that you've taken in order to assist the people of Ukraine, like in terms of medicine or, let's say, other assistance. Could you highlight some of those? So, yes, in fact, I would like to perhaps to highlight two uh, different dimensions. One is now in France, in practical terms, we are hosting more than 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. 100,000 Ukrainian refugees are now in France. Most of them, they are women and children. It means that they are all accommodated and the children are going to school. So it's already, so uh, let's say, a very important effort which is being made by the French government, but let's say also the French people, because there is a very significant movement of solidarity to assist uh, these refugees. Uh, in the other direction, let's say, obviously we are providing some, a lot of uh, medical equipment, a lot of uh, medication, uh, drugs, 
uh, to the to the people and uh, especially in some hospital which had been affected is by the lack lack mm. of uh, you know uh, medical small medical equipment you know and disposable uh, goods for example um, medication yeah. and treatment also for the uh, all the people who had been injured by the war uh, the soldiers but also the civil population which is who is very much affected Previously, I had on the show the ambassador for the UK and also the deputy for the EU. And one of the things they highlighted was how refugees that uh, were, were in the country or refugees that they had taken in were wanting to go back home to help with the efforts in terms of rebuilding their Ukraine. Is that also happening within France? Yes, I would say we have the same, the same feedback from the people. They consider that for them to be in France, they are very grateful, obviously, to, to be in France. And, uh, but at the same time, they really want to go back home as soon as possible. They, for most of them, uh, at least those who are talking to the media, they don't want to settle down in France. They just they consider that they're in France for a kind of transitory period, and then yeah. they want to go back home. And even now, there are some people, even though the war is continuing, they prefer to go back home even now in these circumstances, because they have some family, relatives, friends that they le had left behind, and they prefer to go back to, to Ukraine mm. and take some risk and be with their beloved one, let's say, and assist them. So mm. that's also the kind of situation that we can see uh, in France. And are there any organizations that France is working with in terms of providing assistance and aid? Um, I, I know that you're working with different uh, governments like the UK and that of the EU, but is there any NGO that's currently at the forefront helping with the efforts and relief efforts? So I wouldn't like to mention any specific NGO, but I, I know, for example, uh, Doctors Without Borders, yeah. that kind of big NGO, they go always to the, like, the front line in any country. So I know they are in Ukraine and they are working a lot in hospital clinics. Mm to bring some medical assistance to the people. But some others also are doing the same. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure that for those within the Ukraine and around the world are grateful for the assistance that uh, the, French, the French is giving. But what are some commitments or pledges that France has decided to do with neighboring countries? Are there any at the moment? What do you mean by uh, pledges, um, commitments? Like probably working towards helping those within the Ukraine has there been any recent uh, pledges or commitments that have been with like the UK government or let's say with uh, other neighboring countries? So in fact, EU, uh, France uh, has been uh, the, president, the president of EU Council yeah. during the last six months from January to June. Okay. So the activity of the French government in that uh, specific responsibility was to coordinate and to to lead all the EU efforts mm. in every aspect of the, let's say, EU uh, diplomacy, okay. in including uh, the war in Ukraine. So we have been doing a lot, actually, to coordinate, especially the neighboring countries to Ukraine, like Romania, Czech Republic, yeah. Poland. They receive much more refugees than we are doing because they are really the frontliners. They are just neighbors. Neighbors. So they, they require some specific assistance to face all the concrete problems that they had with these refugees. So obviously EU and France as a member state and mm -hmm. EU presidency. So we we created a lot of program to, uh, to support these countries. Mm. If it's an answer to your yes, question. Yes, yes very yes, much. Yes, yeah. And um, what else, I mean, I know that wheat and also grain is something that not just France, but the rest of the world depends on from the Ukraine. But what are some of the resources that you would say specifically to, towards France that you depend on from the Ukraine? In fact, Ukraine is providing a lot of products which are very important to the let's say, international economy. Yeah. So among the cereals, you have the wheat, but you have also the maize. Maize. And uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, not only the human alimentation, human food, but also for animals, for cattle, for example, they rely on this uh, food which is being made from these cereals. So, and obviously, Ukraine is also an important producer of fertilizer oh, okay. for all the agriculture. So, and they used to export fertilizer worldwide, let's say. So, 
And uh, I, I read, I, I could hear recently on the radio uh, that in fact in even a lot of industrial sectors, in fact they are in the, let's say, uh, value chain. So they, they, they add, they, br they bring some elements, they bring some components. Yeah. And in a lot of sectors of the uh, uh, industry, including cars, including electronics, everything and see that's that's what a lot of people not, weren't really sure and since this this began this whole crisis um the light on ukraine has shed uh, the light on ukraine rather has shed quite a lot because it's quite interesting to hear people talk about it in terms of the conversation and finding out just how important a country like ukraine is to the rest of the world and how this particular uh war that putin has sort of like led has created a mass increase throughout the world in terms of everything from what we're facing right now, cost of living, uh, food prices, and in terms of what the global food security will be like. Uh, but we'll just take a quick break and we'll be back. You're on Speak Your Mind. Welcome back to Speak Your Mind, and uh, it's wonderful having the ambassador of the French Embassy here. Now, Mr. Francois, one of the things that uh, that was brought up, all because of what's happening with Ukraine, or rather the Putin war, is in terms of sports. Now, sports diplomacy plays a big part for any nation, and in this particular case, majority of the countries within the EU, and also UK and France, has come forward in terms of letting bodies know and international sporting bodies on what they can do to sort of limit uh, Russia's thing. What does this look like? How would you want them to sort of like uh, move forward in terms of limiting Russia's participation? So obviously, first I would say that uh, sport uh, is very important to uh, increase uh, the exposure of any country mm. uh, now in the, the world. And we can see the Olympic Games, uh, all the World Cups. Uh, the countries they try to use it to increase, you know, their credibility uh, and uh, the legitimacy. And so it's an important part, let's say, of the uh, great political game. We should not neglect that sports also has uh, some kind of political dimension. And we we could see in the past we had always this issue when the Olympic Games. Uh, took place in the uh, USSR at that time, Soviet Union, or in China also with the issue of human rights. So it had been always raised as a political issue. And uh, the athletes also, there had been always question about it, challenge about it. Uh, should they be part of this World Cup or this Olympic Games in such country? Or, uh, so in that way, if they participate into it, they will le legitimate somehow, you know? Uh, what is going on in this country. So mm. it, it's always political. But sport, on the other hand, in fact, it should interlink people. Obviously, sports, it's a, probably the best way to bring people together, you know, to a game, into a stadium, to watch a good game, you know. And sport, we say always, it's a, another way to do the war. I mean, because in fact, you, 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 you take two teams or athletes, and you put them on the playground and they compete in a fair way yeah. and the winner is a winner and nobody can, you know, uh, contest it, you know. And, uh, but these days with the war in Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, obviously uh, we have to take any measure to, uh, to make R Russia understand that they cannot make as if the normal, uh, the normal situation was still going on. Mm. And especially uh, even in the field of sport. So that's why most of the say, big international organization in the field of sport, they decided to exclude uh, Russian athletes uh, from the international competition. Mm. So, and I think that uh, when the, this war will end and Russia will withdraw from Ukraine, Everybody will be more than happy to have again, let's say, Russian athletes and teams uh, in the, the different uh, world competition. 
So that's what I would like to say specifically about it. And uh, and all the athletes also, like the musicians, for yeah. example, they represent their own country. So the, somehow they cannot say, oh, I'm just an athlete, or I'm just a musician, I'm not Russian, so I won't express myself about this issue, which is such a big issue, yeah. like a big tragedy that ev everybody is facing now. They have to express a point of view. They have to express an opinion. Mm. So that's why sport is so political, let's say. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to come to the positive side, let's say, of this discussion, uh, I think that sport, as I said, can bring people all together. And especially uh, France uh, in the coming years will be hosting uh, three big events, uh, the Rugby World Cup in 2023 and the Olympic Paralympic Game in 2024 at the Rugby League uh, World Competition World mm. Cup in 2025, uh, not forgetting in 2027, the uh, South Pacific Games in uh, Tahiti. So what does it mean? It means that in coming years, we will have a lot of opportunities to, uh, to celebrate sport as a good mean, a good driver to bring people together. Yeah. And uh, in a good way, I hope. And uh, I think this is very positive. And also, this is a good driver for the, the relation between France and Fiji. Uh, because obviously, Fiji is a very important country in terms of sport, <laughs> especially in the field of rugby. And everybody is uh, <laughs> waiting yeah. for Fiji uh, as uh, one of the main team in the Rugby World Cup uh, next year, 2023. And uh, also for the sevens uh, during the Olympic Games. And, uh, and the, let's say, the other competition which still takes uh, after. And uh, I'm very impressed by the game of the rugby uh, players yeah. here. And I'm sure that they will perform very well in France. And they, they, will, they will help, they will contribute highly to upgrade the level of the competition mm. and the interest and also the fun of this uh, competition. And uh, really, I'm very uh, eager to, to having uh, the Fijian players in France next year and the year after. Uh, you're yeah. not the only one who's impressed with uh, a lot of Fijian players. A lot of your French clubs love the Fijian players, hence why we have a number of players that continue to sign with majority of French uh, of the French clubs. That's true. I, I don't know if you know that, but we have mostly let's say two hundred Fijian nationals playing in French 200. teams. Two hundred. Yes. I mean, at different level of the competition, yeah. not only the top fourteen, but also the top fourteen big clubs. And uh, I would say I talked with some senior management people of these different clubs when I was in France. And obviously what they like uh, with the Fijian players is yes. the way they're playing, they, are always, they play very well, and uh, they bring a lot to the team uh, as far as sport is concerned. But also I would say they love very much also their mindset, their mentality, the way they, they, uh, they, they are part of the team, mm. The, the way they respect also the management of the club and they are doing their best to be a good fellow player, let's say. And uh, that's what they, they love very much also. And they so adapt very quickly to the culture and the language. That very quickly, I would say it's not always easy yeah. because in France, uh, some part, some time in the year, it's quite cold. Uh, but I think that they are w very well taken care of in French clubs. And they pay much attention to the Fijian players and they do their best to make sure that they have a good, uh, they can adapt themselves in a good way. Mm. And that this expatriation is, uh, is successful also. This is good for us, yeah. for the club, and it's good for the, for the player himself, obviously. Now, you highlighted the three major events that will be happening in the next uh, coming years. What exactly are the opportunities to develop Fiji, especially in terms of bilateral relationships? With France, that is. With France? Uh, you mean globally or uh, about in, sport? In terms of these particular sporting uh, events? Sport. I, I think that um, my ambition would, like, would be to perhaps to structure a little bit more mm. the cooperation in the field of sport between France and Fiji, not to rely only on, let's say, individual players or on uh, clubs, yeah. but perhaps to develop further the relation between both uh, rugby union or some clubs and bring the French rugby union and some French clubs more, as I said, into more uh, structural cooperation to, to, to develop and to, uh, 
to uh, to develop to the the professionalization of rugby in Fiji. That mm. that's my, my idea, especially for boys, but also for girls. Yeah. Because I'm very amazed by the level of the uh, uh, Fijiana yeah. uh, here, as in seventh or in the fifteenth, they play in an amazing way. Yeah, we're also very proud of them. But yeah. we'll just take yeah. a quick break, and we'll be back. You're on Speak Your Mind. Welcome back to Speak Your Mind. Now, um, Mr. Francois, you, you spoke about how some of the things that, like, I absolutely love, like, what you would love to do, uh, some of the initiatives you're hoping to create in terms of progressing and building rugby, especially bilateral relationships between France and Fiji. Uh, you highlighted in terms of uh, women's sports, but also what I'd like to know is that would, could we see more of French clubs setting up base here in terms of recruitment or will they just be scouts coming down? Mm, you know, the uh, professional sport yeah. is uh, as its own rules that we have to know it. Okay. And I'm not part of that uh, <laughs> professional sport world, you know. And uh, you have a lot of the clubs, you have the agents, yeah. you, know, you have all the lawyers and you have also the financial aspect of all these and uh, I think what is very important for Fijian players is to, uh, let's say, to find their own way in that system and take the best of it, uh, have a successful career, and uh, be able after the end of their career, because they usually, obviously, athletes and they, their career is quite short, yeah. uh, they can find a way to, to, uh, for a new, a new professional life. I think that's very important. And to get good advice for it, from lawyers, from let's say financial consultants, and from the clubs, sports professional. I think this is very important. Some kind of coaching, let's say. And another point is, you know, um, I would dream to have a, a French national team coming here, like in 1998. Yeah. Or I would love to bring here some uh, top 14 uh, team here to 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 challenge a little bit the Fijian players on the ground, oh, the playground nice. here in uh, Nandi or in Lautoka or here in Suva. And uh, I would I would love to do it, you know. So I'm discussing a lot with the, these clubs and the, the rugby union to try to get it. But you know, the calendar is very heavy, very tight, and uh, uh, it's not so so easy. But I would love to, to do it. And the second point is, um, on the more structural way, let's say, uh, I would love also to to uh, to involve one of these uh, French uh, actor, let's say, of the rugby in more, uh, let's, say, let's say, for example, for rugby academies, that kind of things, yeah. you know, to, to support, to bring, to bring to the Fijian rugby um, what need he may express, you know, uh, in terms of uh, training, facilities, coaching, all this. Mm -hmm. is, I, I have to ask, is there any uh, Fijian rugby player based in France or uh, part of the Fiji team that uh, you're a fan of? Um, I have good friends, in fact, in the rugby world, and uh, for example, in uh, Bordeaux, he's a former player, but he's very active to support all Fijian players in France. Julien Vulacoro. Okay. Yes, uh, he's uh, now active uh, inside the French Rugby Union. Yeah. In fact, especially in the perspective of the Rugby World Cup, mm. but he's doing a lot to support all Fijian players uh, in France. So I don't know if he will listen to that program, but <laughs> I would like to <laughs> to thank him and uh, send him my regards. Yeah. Now I love uh, all that you've mentioned, and France is also working a lot with uh, Pacific Island nations in terms of contribution to climate change. What does that look like? Like in terms of uh, climate change, what are some of the initiatives? Ah, climate change, yeah. yes. Uh, in fact, you know, France, we have a very consistent policy about climate change. We have been involved in the COP21 and uh, let's say try to bring the international community just to the awareness mm -hmm. of the reality of the climate change and that we have really to take strong decision to face it. 
And uh, we have been one of the very, very strong players, let's say, of this uh, climate change initiatives, big conferences. And uh, so, and here in South Pacific, we know that the Pacific uh, insular countries are among those who are the most vulnerable, let's say, yeah. to the impact of climate change with coastal erosion, for example, the rise of the sea level, and also the big uh, natural disaster like hurricanes. So um, here in South Pacific, we have a specific uh, regional program, which is Kiwa Initiative, uh, which is uh, on a yearly basis 50 million uh, euro. And the idea we participate into it along with Australia, New Zealand, Canada, EU and France. Mm. And the idea is to try to, to promote uh, nature based solution at different level to face the impact of climate change. And uh, especially you have different kinds of uh, program uh, at the local level. So some villages, communities, local NGOs, they can propose some projects yeah. which can be funded obviously by this initiative. And then you have more glo globally some regional program to try to promote some uh, different, uh, let's say, way of production. And uh, for example, to promote uh, organic farming uh, or to try to adapt agriculture to the uh, climate change, try to find new way to develop uh, farmers income, yeah. you know, for example. And uh, at, so at different level, this Kiwa initiative uh, intends to, 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 to promote nature-based solution. Mm. And uh, it's quite successful, quite successful. And uh, here in July, we will have one of the committee uh, with all stakeholders of this Kiwa initiative here yeah. in Suva. And could you highlight uh, some of the initiatives or what the programs look like? Yes, exactly. For example, yesterday in uh, Nandi, you had a workshop uh, to promote organic farming uh, with a lot of producers, including uh, one who will attend the workshop about uh, gender issues this afternoon, yeah. and uh, with involved in vanilla production, to, to, to try to, to uh, how could I say, to build the capacity, to do some capacity building mm. uh, among this, uh, these producers' uh, association. Yeah, and uh, apart from... Uh, Apart from generating funds and allowing, you know, those within certain groups to sort of work on the programs themselves, are, are you offering specialists as a form of uh, assistance as well in terms of farming or maybe uh, how to adapt through climate change? We, here we are doing it through many channels. Yeah. So let's say one is through the French Development Agency, EFD, uh, which is in charge of this Kiwa initiative. And the other way is through all the EU programs. Here, the EU delegation, so they spend a lot of funds here, let's say, on roughly on a yearly basis, 100 billion euro. Uh, so and uh, France is, let's say, 17%, less than 20% of the total amount of the contribution. So if you calculate it, it means so 17.8% uh, of 100 million euro a year. Is, is coming from the French contribution. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's quite significant, I would say. It is. Yes. It yeah. is. Um, with, uh, with, with some of the traits, or rather some of the initiatives that will be going, definitely want to touch on that, but we'll just take a quick break and we'll be back. You're on Speak Your Mind. back to speak your mind and uh, I'm with the ambassador for the French embassy and he's also a recipient of the National Order of Merit Chevalier. Now this is Mr. Francois Xavier Lige and we've spoken about a lot of uh, assistance that the French government is doing within the Pacific and one of them is a particular prize that someone in Fiji has won. Uh, could, you, yes. could you talk more on this particular prize? Yes. I would say that at the embassy early March, we were so we were so proud and happy uh, to get the news from Paris that uh, our Fijian candidate could get that prize. And uh, th that prize, in fact, it had been uh, named uh, from a former French female politician, Simone Veil. Uh, so, with very prominent politician in France, yeah. 
Uh, in fact, she uh, she was from a Jewish family, so she was deported during the Second World War, mm. and but she uh, survived from it, and then she entered the let's say the French uh, judicial system. She became a, a judge, and then she entered the um, administration of the Ministry of Justice, and then she entered. She started a political career as a feminist, and uh, as the, when she was appointed as a Minister of Health. Uh, she uh, did, she did a lot to promote the right of women of women, and especially she is very well known because in fact she is the one who has submitted to the French National Assembly a law about the right of ab abortion in France. Okay, and then th that law at that time it was in seventy four was adopted by the French uh, Parliament, and at that time it was a big revolution, and uh, obviously there is a right of abortion but behind it or. Beyond it, what is important is the right of women uh, to to, uh, to to control their own body, exactly, and uh, if they want to have children or not, you know. And it was the obviously the substance of that uh, of that uh, of that law, and uh, so she she was so famous, and she became also the first president uh, of the uh, European Parliament. So she had huge responsibilities at the national and also European level. So she was hugely respected. So she passed away in 2017. And then the French President Macron, he decided to create a prize to, to commemorate her and to celebrate what she had been doing, you know. And that prize is, uh, is to, uh, to, to, to award, let's say, to award either one woman or a group of women uh, which is uh, defending the right of women in the, in the world, you know. So we had one lady from Cameroon, a group of women, uh, female activists from Ecuador, mm. uh, one lady uh, from Afghanistan, and the fourth one is a Fijian one, you know. We were so proud. And Komal Narayan, yeah. uh, it is her name, uh, she's a prominent, young, but very prominent and well-known uh, female activist from Fiji in the field of climate change. And she had been attending all the big conferences uh, related to climate change and the fight against it in the world recently. She had been part of some UN meetings about it. And uh, really, we felt that she could fill up all the criteria to get this prize. And along with my uh, deputy here yeah. at the embassy, so we, we submitted our candidacy. And we were so uh, surprised and honored that she could get it. And I think for Fiji, uh, it's good for Fiji because it's bringing Fiji very high on the agenda. Yeah. Uh, we could have, uh, let's say, a uh, life uh, ceremony with France, and my minister could award her uh, this, uh, this uh, special prize. We did it online because uh, she was pregnant at that time. And uh, since then, she had a wonderful baby. And, uh, but she, then uh, we, she, she will go to France before the end of the year. Yeah. And, uh, and then we are preparing for her a full program uh, where she, could be able, she would be able to meet uh, French institutions, French NGOs, all people involved in climate change mm. and also uh, women's rights. So we will, I'm sure we, she will have a very, very interesting and meaningful program there. So we are very proud. And, uh, well, we are definitely proud in he here in Fiji, the fact that Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Narayan won that award because representation is important. And the people of the Pacific representing in terms of climate change is so important because we are definitely at the front line in terms of the rising sea levels. Yes. Um, with that being said, one of the things that you highlighted, women's rights. I believe you have an event today, a roundtable discussion around women's rights and feminists and the struggles that they face here in Fiji. Could you tell me more about that? That's true. And by the way, uh, Komal Narayan will be among the uh, participants of oh, that roundtable. So obviously we have nothing to teach to Fiji, Yeah. Uh, but we can bring Fijian people together, together in that roundtable to talk about gender issue in Fiji. And I think uh, as such, it's already an added value and it's a part of the, what we call uh, the uh, feminist diplomacy in France, which is in one hand to promote women and to devote 
at least 75% uh, of our ODA to project having this uh, gender issue yeah. mentioned. And uh, in, uh, in the other end, uh, they do our own homework, let's say, and promote women uh, in the French Foreign Service which is very important too, you know? Yeah. And uh, so today, during that round table, we will bring all together some uh, uh, activists and people who are active in that field of the promotion of women's rights here in Fiji and the gender issue as a whole. Mm. And uh, I'm sure it would be very, very interesting. Definitely yeah. it would be very interesting. Would it also be um, live on the Facebook page of the French Embassy? So some, uh, some journalists of the press will be is invited. Yeah. Uh, but let's say for this turntable, no, it won't be live. And yeah, yeah, perhaps next time we will be more than happy to do it. It'd be great to see yeah. the discussions around yes. that. Um, yes. Of course, month of July, July 14th is marked as uh, Bastille Day, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. Is there any plans of celebration for probably here in Fiji? Just to conclude with the, with the women's rights, we know we, our, our, our prime minister is a woman. Yeah. M my minister is a woman. The speaker, the new speaker of the French National Assembly is a woman. That's very interesting. It is, it is yeah. very interesting. So the, to, to come to the 14th of July, so you know from the 12th to the 14th of July here, you will have the uh, Pacific Island Forum Summit, yeah. the summit. So we consider that it would be risky to organize uh, our national day party the same day. So we decided to postpone it a little bit, but we will have it definitely. And uh, I can announce, I don't know, uh, uh, here formally, officially, that it will take place the 18th, yeah. the 18th of July at the French residence in Suva. Yes, so I, I think for everybody, it's good to come back to normal life yes. and to attend the party <laughs> uh, all together and uh, to meet and interact with people. So. Well, Mr. Ambassador, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come out today and really talking more about most a lot of issues that you know we need to talk about as a community as a whole and especially touching on the uh, food security crisis that we're currently facing but seriously uh thank you for taking out the time and i do hope we get to see more of you on the show thank you I, i'm very grateful to the uh, people of fiji for their hospitality uh, during my mission here really thank you so much to all the listeners thank you well, that's all we have time for for today for Speak Your Mind. Remember, you can join me same time, same place next week.